Children of the living God, come and sing, sing out loud. Children of the living God, sing to the living God. Chapter 23, verses 1 through 25 this morning. The title of the message is The Great Exchange. And um, I think most of you probably already know this. I use that description a lot in the teaching of the Word, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. I like to summarize that as the great exchange. It particularly highlights this Christian doctrine called justification by faith. How many have heard of that doc doctrine? Justification by faith. It's kind of a fancy term, but really it's, um, it's really a great exchange. That's how I like to list it. And so for us sinners, ones who inherently get, uh, can't get to heaven because we've missed the mark, and that mark is what? Perfection. And that literally is what the word sin means. I don't know if you ever looked up the word sin in Greek. It means missing the mark. It's an archer's term. Does anybody ever do archery? What do you have to hit? You have to hit the bullseye. And so sin is an archer's term. It's when you miss the mark. You miss the bullseye. You know what that bullseye is for us? Sin? It's perfection. And so we all need to be perfect to get to heaven. Anybody perfect here? So we're all going down. <laughs> apart from Jesus. Right? So that's the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, Be ye perfect as your Father is perfect in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. And so that counts all of us out, huh? We're not going to get there. It counts out all of us until Jesus, the perfect man who came. He became the perfect sacrifice, and not only to cover sin, but to remove sin. And so that takes us to this great exchange. The Apostle Paul, he described it like this. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. And that there is that great exchange. And indeed, the greatest exchange in human history. Our sins imputed to Jesus at the cross of Calvary, and then he died. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And in exchange, his righteousness, for those who believe, is now imputed to us, and we live. We live eternally, back in fellowship with God who is holy. And so we'll get to that in more detail toward the end of our passage this morning, this great exchange. It lays at the center of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many of you have heard that term, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It really does lay upon this great exchange, justification by faith. All right, so we're going to get into that in a little bit. So we're going to read our passage entirely this morning, verses 1 through 25, Luke chapter 23, and then we'll look at the parts in a little bit. Because this all stands as we read the Word of God together. Luke chapter 23, verses 1 through 25. Getting right to the end of the Gospel of Luke here. All right, so Luke chapter 23, right at verse 1, says, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the king. Verse 3. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. Verse 4. So Pilate and said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Verse 6, And when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man, Jesus, were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some kind of miracle done by him. Verse 9, then he questioned him with many words, but Jesus answered him nothing. Verse 10, and the chief priests, the scribes, stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, verse 11, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. Verse 12, that very day Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. Verse 13, then Pilate when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me 
as one who misleads the people. And indeed, I having examined him in your presence, I found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod. For I sent you back to him, and indeed, nothing deserving of death has been, has, has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. Verse 18. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, and released us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Verse 20. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Verse 22, then he said to them the third time, why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Verse 23, they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. Verse 24, so Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. Finally, verse 25, and he released them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Well, Lord, I just want to lift up these verses to you and ask that you anoint them, give us understanding into this great exchange, the exchange of an innocent for the guilty. Help us to understand that message, the good news of Jesus Christ, what it cost. It cost us nothing, it cost you everything, Lord. Help us to come to terms and to understand that. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. Okay, so before we get started into the verse-by-verse -verse parts of our passage, I want you to remember from last week, we noted an interesting detail regarding our Lord's sentencing. He was sentenced to death by the Sanhedrin for what? For blasphemy. Because he, a mere man, was claiming to be God. Remember, he publicly received the title Son of God, which was a claim to deity. And so if you look with me back just prior to this chapter, chapter 22, the last two verses, verses 70 and 71, let me read that to you again. It says, then they all said, are you the Son of God? And so he said, Jesus said to them, you rightly say that I am. And they said, the Sanhedrin, what further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. That is, you've heard the blasphemy yourself. We have heard it ourselves. He claims to be equal with God. And we noted last Sunday how the title Son of God means just that, equality with God. Son of God does not mean a biological son because God is spirit. Son of God means of the order of God and carries the clear meaning of being equal with God. It was clear to the Sanhedrin, the ruling religious leaders of Israel, and that's why they said, what further testimony do we need? Make no mistake about it here. Jesus, he claimed deity, equality with God, when he publicly received the title Son of God. You rightly said that I am, say that I am. And so they determined now to put him to death for blasphemy. But here's the peculiar and interesting thing. Jesus, he wasn't stoned, was he? He was crucified. Now why is that? Israel always used stoning to exercise capital punishment. But here they go through Roman government to exercise capital punishment. And that would be through the Roman governor Pilate, which we just read about. But this was all foreordained by God because God's word prophesied about a thousand years prior how Messiah would die. It would not be by stoning, it would be by crucifixion. Now, last week I gave you an assignment for all of you to read Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Now, you don't have to raise your hands if you haven't read, if you read it or not. But hopefully you did, or hopefully you have previously. Psalm 22 was written by King David about a 1,000 years before this, before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. About a 1,000 years before crucifixion was even heard of. 
let alone the Roman Empire who had perfected it. And then Isaiah 53 was prophesied about 700 years prior to Christ. And yet, when you read those prophecies written way back then, you get more detail on the crucifixion of Messiah Jesus and how he died than in all the gospel accounts combined. Now you have to ask yourself, how can that be? Why would that be? Well, because God, who foreknows all and is sovereign, said it. That's how Messiah is going to die. He clearly said a thousand years prior to the cross how Messiah would die for the sins of the world. God's word prophesied, and history then fulfills it. Now, I also mentioned last week that Israel, at some point in time, around the time that Jesus came on the scene, lost its power to exercise capital punishment. Right around the time Jesus came on the scene. And John's gospel account gives us insight into this. Let me read this. John chapter 18, verses 31 and 32. This is the same account that we're reading about in Luke, but it's from John's perspective. He gives us a little bit more detail. You can mark this in your notes. It's very fascinating. John chapter 18, verse 31 says, Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law, to the law of the Jews. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. John chapter 18, verses 31 and 32. And what death would that be? It would be by crucifixion, not stoning, and all to fulfill God's word, including Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, which says this, because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. And the apostle Paul even quoted Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, when he explained the cross. He said this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. And so think about this, very peculiar. Until that time, Israel was stoned for capital punishment. But in that sliver of time of history, right when Jesus comes on the scene, they lose that authority. And so they now have to go through the Roman government to execute capital punishment, which does it by crucifixion, thus fulfilling Psalm 22, written a thousand years prior, before crucifixion was ever known, before the Roman Empire was ever heard of. And then in Isaiah 53, you can read what Jesus went through at the cross, the suffering servant. Now, you think this is all coincidence? <coughs> that Israel was stripped of its authority to exercise capital punishment by stoning right around the time Jesus came on the scene? Do you think Pilate concocted this? He says, oh, I was reading Psalm 22. I think I'll do it this way. I think you'd be a fool to think that. This is God's word. Prophecy and the fulfillment of prophecy. <clears throat> Just another example of God's word being fulfilled. David Guzik, he quotes Clark, a commentator by Clark, and he wrote this. He wrote, the power of life and death was in all probability taken from the Jews when Archelaus, king of Judea, was banished to Vienna. And Judea was made a Roman province. Judea be what? One of the vicinities in, in, uh, in Israel. And this happened more than 50 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. When was the destruction of Jerusalem? 70 AD. 50 years before? Would have been right around the time, maybe five, six, seven years before Jesus was crucified, that they were stripped of stoning because Jesus would need to be crucified to fulfill Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. And so when you read this, you have to say, this is God's word. Now, this is not the only example. This is God's word. It foretells and it's fulfilled. And so this is God's word, and we surely ought to be reading it, huh? 
I think we ought to be studying it. And we surely ought to be living by it. Because God says what he means and God means what he says. And God's word always comes to pass. You see, surely the Sanhedrin, Israel's religious ruling council, would have stoned him if they could. But they couldn't. And therefore, this whole back and forth with Pilate and Herod to sentence Jesus to crucifixion went forward. The governors, they didn't want to do it, as we read. They knew Jesus was innocent, but they caved in to the pressure from the Sanhedrin, thus fulfilling the scripture that they would be exercising execution through crucifixion. And so with that background, background, let's begin to look at the parts of our passage. It's going to make a little bit more sense, the back and forth here, okay? All right, so verse 1, chapter 23 says, Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. This would be the governor, a Roman governor. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, the nation of Rome, and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, the king. So I want you to notice this. The attempt to bring charges upon Jesus so Jesus can be punished under Roman law. Notice that. We found this fellow perverting the nation of Rome and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. That is paying taxes to the Roman leader and then saying that he himself is Christ the king. That is, he is claiming to be a king over Caesar. Those are the accusations. So you can see how these accusations are an attempt to get him, to get him in trouble with Rome so that Rome would punish him and that Rome would put him to death by crucifixion. They would, as I mentioned, have stoned Jesus if they could. But according to John's gospel that we just read, they no longer had that authority, which makes it so interesting in my mind to see how God's word pre precisely comes to pass. And I just say it again, you can't make this stuff up. How do you make this up? The Bible we have in our hands this morning is the very word of God. And it would be wise for us to read it and to understand it and to live by it. Verse 3, then Pilate asked him, saying, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, it is as you say. Now, last Sunday, we looked at three titles given to our Lord. Remember what those were? Christ the Son of Man and the Son of God. Now, right here is the title King, which really is synonymous with Christ or Messiah in the Hebrew language. Now, remember that Christ is the Greek word. Christ is not his name, not his last name. I used to always think that, not growing up in the church. There's Jesus' first name and Christ's last name. That's not true. Jesus' is his first name and his only name. Jesus, the Son of Mary, the son of Joseph. Christ is his title. Christ means the anointed one, anointed by God. And Messiah is the Hebrew word for the word Christ. And so when a Jew says Messiah, they're talking about the Christ. Uh, they don't receive Jesus as Messiah. And they're waiting for the Messiah. But Messiah and Christ are the same. One's in Greek and one's in Hebrew. But here when Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? He's really asking him if he's their Messiah, if he's the Christ. Because as we've noted previously, Israel was looking for their Messiah to rule and reign as king, not to die for the sins of the world. And we noted that time and time again, there are two comings of Messiah. There's two comings of Christ. The first coming is to pay the price for sin. The second is to rule and reign as a physical king. Therefore, Israel had one half of that truth, the rule and reign half. But they missed the first half, the dying for the sins of the world. And that really is the important half when you think about it. Why is that? Because without receiving the first half, you're not going to receive the second half. Without the receiving of the forgiveness of sin, you're not going to rule and reign with Christ. And so your sins need to be forgiven to be born again of the Spirit. And you can be born again of the Spirit of God when your sins are removed. 
And your sins can only be removed through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. It is God's gift to you through his son who took upon himself your sin and my sin and then died. For the wages of sin is death. But in return, we now have a righteous standing before God who is holy. Paul put it this way. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourself. You can't save yourself. You can't hit that bullseye. You're a sinner. You're not perfect. For it is by grace, a gift, you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. You can't do it yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. But once you have been saved, receive that free gift. Once the Spirit of God comes into your life, the Holy Spirit is now the down payment that is put in your life. And that guarantees the transformation of your mortal body into a heavenly body made for the heavens. And that's going to happen at the rapture of the church. And if you're taking notes, that's described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, 17, and 18, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 54. There'll be a day when Christ will come for his church. And the dead in Christ will rise first, Paul said. So all your loved ones in Christ that have died, they're going to come up from the grave and receive a heavenly body. And then we who are living at the rapture are going to join them in the air and be with Jesus and rule and reign with him forever and ever. That's the promise of God's word. But is that down payment of the Holy Spirit in you when you become born again, that's the deposit. So when the Lord comes to rapture his church, he's going to look for everybody with the Holy Spirit. That's the down payment. No Holy Spirit, no go. You have the Holy Spirit, you go. The Spirit of God in you. It comes by being born again. Your sins have to be removed through the blood of Jesus Christ, and then the Holy Spirit comes in you. That's the deposit that guarantees that you're going to get a body made for the heavens when Jesus returns for his church. And it's during that time that we will rule and reign with Christ. Therefore, it is at his return, at his coming again, that the rule and reign comes physically, that Jesus will rule and reign as king physically. And in our passage here, that is actually what Israel was thinking in regard to Messiah, a king who will rule and reign, who will bring Israel to the height of its power, a king who will overthrow Rome, so they wouldn't have to come under Rome's sovereignty. That's what they were waiting for. But you know what happened? They missed it. They missed his first coming because they weren't expecting a king to die for the sins of the world. And so there really is a lot packed into this question when you think about it. Are you the king of the Jews? A lot packed into that question. And really, Pilate didn't understand what that question was about, what Jesus was asking. Because he was only concerned with the king of Rome, which was Tiberius Caesar at the time, historically, which obviously Jesus posed no threat to him. He's under arrest. But Pilate had no idea what he was asking. Only Jesus did. And so Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. So these chief priests and the crowd, however, were also without understanding. They, too, did not understand this first coming for the forgiveness of sins. The only one who really understood the question was Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? And only Jesus fully understood his own answer. It is as you say. See, Jesus wasn't his king. Didn't look like a king then, but he is king. But the king must die to remove sins before the king can rule and reign with you. Now verse 5. But they were more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. And verse 6. And when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at, the, at that time. 
Now, this would be Herod Antipas. There's a lot of different Herods. It's Herod Antipas, the governor over the Galilee area. He was the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. And so when Pilate found out that Jesus was from Galilee, he sent him over to Herod to deal with him. Verse 8. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him. And he hoped to see some miracle done by him. And so, kind of an interesting detail that Dr. Luke inserts here. And he hoped to see some miracle. It doesn't say he hoped to see Jesus, did he? Hope to see some miracle. See, he wasn't interested in Jesus per se, only in the miracles. He wanted to see a miracle. And you know, it's a common, common misguide even in our day, I think. People sometimes are more in it for the miracles than they are for the person of Jesus. And sometimes you see a lot of that in these stadiums that fill up with miracle seekers and not Jesus seekers. There's that principle, what can the Lord do for me? mentality. Now, get me wrong. The Lord can do a lot for you, and he does. He does a lot for us in the here and now. And so I never want to negate God's work in miracles, because God does miracles. He wouldn't be God if he can't. And you know, I'm not kidding. I've seen miracles, personally. But I don't build my faith upon miracles. <clears throat> build my faith upon the person of Jesus. But miracles can never be the main focus for why we seek our Lord. You've heard me say this before. The miracles, they ratify the message. Which is more important, the miracles or the message? Absolutely. The miracles will wear off. Lazarus, when he was raised from the dead, he died. The message is eternal. Miracles are temporal. Message is eternal. And you know, there's something much more deep and profound than miracles. And that is a one-on-one -on -one intimate relationship with the king. You know, I think about, you know, for those of you who have children, I've heard me mention this, you know, how would you like it if your child said, hey, you know, mommy, daddy, I love you now. Can you buy me a car? <laughs> is that why? Is, what, is that what the relationship is built on, a car? The things you can get, rather than the face-to-face. -face. So think about our Lord. Every time we come to the Lord, hey, can you give me this? Can you give me that? Can you give me that? Now, the Lord does give us a lot, doesn't he? But you know what he really wants? Is you to have a relationship with him. And, you know, that's really the, where the depth of the miracles are. It's in the relationship. The real miracle... I don't just say this to sound like a cliche, you know, religious cliche, you know how they throw these around, right? But, you know, the real miracle is a personal relationship with the God of the universe. I mean, can you imagine that Jesus, in whom all things hold together, the Bible says, you know what he calls you? The God of the universe now calls you friend. Can you imagine that? You know, it makes me think about this. You never ask this, like, who am I to be a friend with the God of the universe? Who am I? Who am I to even have a relationship with God? I mean, I look back on my life. Who am I? A nobody. And he calls me friend. John 15, verse 15 says this, No longer do I call you servants. These are the words of Jesus. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. See, Jesus calls you a friend. He is Lord for sure. But he's your friend. Our Lord allows us to intimately know him and what he is doing in and through us and around us through his presence. You see, we have an inside track to the heart of God by the Spirit of God that came through the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That there is the real miracle. That you and I can have a relationship with the God whose right hand spans the universe. And when you take time to think about it, think about that. The God of the universe died for you so that he can call you friend. Think about that. That dwarfs any other miracle. It really does. All the other miracles wear off. 
Even if you were raised from the dead, you're going to want to die again. I don't know about you, I don't want to die twice. <laughs> My wants is enough. But the eternal miracle is that you have a relationship with him forever. That's the real miracle. Now verse 9. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered in nothing. Verse 10. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod with his men of war treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other. For previously they had been at enmity or enemies with each other. It's a rather interesting thing that the one thing that these pagan governors could agree upon was their hatred towards Jesus. Everything else they disagreed. Kind of reminds you, you know, Governor Newsom and Governor DeSantis. They can't agree on anything. But you know, such was the case here. Except for they hated Jesus. The name of Jesus either divides or unites. There really is no middle ground. I don't know if you ever kind of talk to people about Jesus. There's a group that hates Jesus. There's a group that loves Jesus. There, there seems to be no middle ground. And you know, Jesus, he even said that. He, he said that in, um, when he was teaching, he said, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. And so we shouldn't be surprised with the same when we take a stand for our Lord. It will unite us with like hearts and it will divide us with others. Kind of like the political structure, us, um, the political spectrum. Is there any middle ground? Not anymore. It's one way or the other. And such it is with faith in Christ. You know, if you go into the workplace and you tell your boss, you know what, I'm working for Jesus, they probably look at you like you're crazy if he's not a Christian. That's a good thing, you're working for Jesus. You know what, because scripture says, do all things unto the Lord, not for man, because you know your reward is in heaven. When I see somebody that's really working for Jesus, I know he's a good worker, because he knows he's gonna stand before the Lord. He's gonna give an account. Whether he works for a million dollars, or whether he works for zero dollars, he's gonna do all things as unto the Lord. He's gonna do a good job. And so you're either for him or against him. And these two, Pilate and Herod, finally agreed on one thing. But unfortunately, it was against Jesus and not for him. And so you have to wonder what judgment awaits them. That every opportunity to agree on Jesus and agree with Jesus, but they chose not to in tandem. But you know, the same could be said for us and those who have heard the name of Jesus and have been given ample opportunity to receive him as Lord. We're going to be accountable as well for the revelation given us. And in that day, we're going to give an account. Now, verse 13, then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, Having examined him in your presence, I found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. So in short, he's saying, he's not guilty. I have found him not guilty. Now verse 15, and neither did Herod. For I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. Verse 16, I will therefore chastise him and release him. For it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. Verse 18, and they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, and released us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Verse 20, Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said, verse 22 to them, the third time, why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevail. You know, this is the case that if you yell something loud enough and enough times, you'll get your way. Even it is a lie. You see that today? 
And it goes along the line of the pathological liar. He tells himself a lie so many times that he begins to believe it's the truth. You ever meet somebody like that? It's really a sad commentary. They're living the lie because they told the lie so many times. It usually has to do with themselves. They, they believe the lie as if it's true. I don't know. I kind of think it's what we're seeing now even in our news outlets today. Anybody read the news? I mean, it's real difficult to find out the truth about anything today because of the corruption in some of our news organizations. Freedom of the press. It doesn't mean freedom to lie, does it? I don't think so. Anybody uh, go to journalist school? What does freedom of the press mean? You're free to report the truth at all costs. They think it's freedom to lie. I mean, one news organization says one thing and another the polar opposite. Can both be true? Logic 101. They both can't be true because they're saying opposite things. And then context. Does anybody talk about context anymore? Do you know I can say anything I want to say by taking one word or one sentence out of context? And I think these news organizations, they know about context, but they choose not to know. But this is exactly what's happening here. Pilate, he knows Jesus is innocent, but the crowd yells louder and louder. And then the lie becomes the truth. It's a sad commentary, isn't it? But let me add this. A person who gives in to what is obviously a lie like this is a weak person. Taking a stand for the truth takes courage. It does. Bowing to a lie that a multitude shouts over and over again is the action of a coward. Pilate is a coward. I mean, can you say anything else? When you know something's the truth and you're swayed into telling a lie, you're a weak person. Pilate is a weak person. He's displaying his spinelessness right here. Now, verse 24. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. Pretty sad, isn't it? He gave in to the lie because he couldn't stand up to the crowd. Ultimately, he couldn't stand, take a stand for the truth. He yielded to the lie. You know, he's going to be held accountable to it. There'll be a day when all of us will stand before the Lord and give an account. All of us. And you're not going to be able to lie before the Lord. For believers, it will be at the Bema Seat judgment of Christ. For non believers, it will be at the great white throne judgment. But separate judgments, but we're all going to be accountable for what we say and do in this life. It should keep all of us very sober in what we say and do in this life. And even for believers, even though you're saved, you're gonna stand before the Lord and give an account. And I don't think you're gonna talk back. It should keep us all very humble. Verse 25, and he released to them the one they requested who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. They released him, but he delivered Jesus to their will. And so Pilate released Barabbas, the guilty, and delivered Jesus, the innocent, unto death. It is indeed an interesting illustration of this fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith called justification by faith. Justification through faith by grace. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, for the grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works that anyone should boast. And that is the great exchange, as I so often allude to, in a lot of my teaching. It's the layman's term. The great exchange. 
It's a layman's term for justification by faith. It understand, underscores this, this great doctrine of justification. And it is what is poignantly illustrated here, I believe, in our passage this morning. An innocent for the guilty. Jesus the innocent, Barabbas the guilty. Justification by faith, Paul explained this in his letters to Romans and Galatians. It's the great exchange. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. But now, the righteousness of God apart from law is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. You see, our right standing before God, who is holy, is only through the righteous and perfect man, Jesus Christ. Only through him. And that is exemplified here through the exchange of Jesus, an innocent, for Barabbas, the guilty. Jesus was brought before Pilate for perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. It was a false accusation, and everyone knew it. But the Jews demanded that he be crucified. Why? What evil has he done, Pilate asked. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And then the voices of these men and, their, and the chief priests, they prevailed. Verse 23, Pilate yielded. But in that we see the prophecy of the cross fulfilled, the vehicle by which this great exchange was exercised. So God is in control, isn't he? an innocent assuming the sentence for the guilty. And so remember, it was an annual custom to release a prisoner on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Pilate wanted to release Jesus, but the crowd demanded Barabbas. And it was that definitive exchange of an innocent for the guilty. But here's the interesting thing to note. This identifies the real exchange that is available to you and I. Sinners, not perfect, that have to come through the innocent blood of Jesus to stand before holy God. You see, no one is perfect, and yet perfection is the requirement for heaven. And therefore, the gap must be bridged by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord. That is the gospel, the good news. Jesus Christ. You and I must have our sins exchanged for our Lord's righteousness. And that only comes by way of the cross that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The vital exchange is our sin imputed to Jesus and his righteousness imputed to us. And when that is accomplished by grace through faith, we become children of God, able to go directly into our Heavenly Father's presence, behind the veil, into the Holy of Holies. And that's where the greatest blessing resides, through that great exchange. It came, however, at great cost, did it not? It came through the sacrifice of the Son, our perfect and innocent Lord. That's how it came. Great cost. It cost me nothing but my pride. It cost God everything. And that's what we're going to see as we finish up chapter 3. Chapter 23, excuse me. The cross is next week. The resurrection the following week. And so you won't want to miss it. If you do miss it this Sunday, next Sunday, Read it in your own time. This is where the apex of history comes, right there at the cross and the resurrection. The destination of eternity lies right there for you and I. We need to not just read it, but understand it, what happened. And as you understand it, you'll walk in it. And you'll possess it as yours. Amen? Lord, we thank you for your word.
Help us, I pray, to come to terms with these scriptures, to understand them, not just with our minds, but with our hearts as well, that your word, by your spirit, will change us. That the truth of your word would resonate deep down within us. Oh, Lord, that we would leave this place different than how we came. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.